Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me for another episode of GM Cause Podcast. Hit that like button and you know what to do. Kevin Hackey, his FBI involvement as being an informant against death row for um, racketeering and money laundering and things of that nature. As you may know, and it's probably no mystery, a lot of these rap labels were a front, even though they were making money, millions of dollars, selling records. They were actually also um, doing money laundering and, and you know, doing drugs. And, and I, with all that comes racketeering and many other nefarious activities that these record label heads or whatever or people that were associated with them were actually doing. But moving on to what the real deal here as far as what the real topic of discussion is going to be today is that you had Kevin Hackey who was uh, infiltrated Defro Records from early on, early 90s. And you have the... At, at, at point here, we have you know the Nick, the Nick Broomfield documentary, which was pretty fresh after the murder of Notorious B.I.G. And, and it touched on a lot of just evidence that essentially LAPD ignored. And you know the reason why they ignored it was because they wanted to just slam shut the case so that there would be any ghost or skeletons in the closet coming out as far as the lawsuits that were going to be committed and the uh, people that were going to be let out of jail for being falsely accused and falsely imprisoned by corrupt police officers doing such things as stealing drugs from evidence lockers and shooting drug dealers and stealing their money and being lookout protection for drug dealers to do trans drugs transactions and things of that nature it was pretty much the wild west LAPD brass either knew or didn't know what was taking place, but of course they were going to do everything in their power to make sure that none of none of as, as much as possible nothing actually got out to the public to where people would start questioning. And a lot of people did question, but essentially, if you really think about it, there wasn't a whole lot of press coverage on it as much as there should have been. But that's another subject. Anyhow, so. I'm going to take you down memory lane, so to speak, and and you can open your mind here when I speak to you about this, and you, and, and you can really, really expand your horizons if you just listen to what I'm about to tell you about the, the Notorious B.I.G. case. Now, you're going to see here for a fact, and you're going to listen for a fact, what took place. Now, in the documentary, you have, of course, Eugene Deal identifying Amir Muhammad as being one of the people present that night that could potentially be one of the shooters of the Notorious B.I.G. And when I say one of the shooters, you essentially have four suspects in in question. You have David Mack, you have Amir Muhammad, Rafael Perez, and then you have uh, Amir Muhammad. Now, I want you to question this here. Now, you have Amir Muhammad... You have Little C's and you have Eugene Deal, who they they hired, and the police the police actually either hired or they have somebody on their payroll who is a composite sketch artist. Okay, now the composite sketch artist doesn't have a picture of any of the suspects, obviously, right? So what happens is is the composite sketch artist sits down with the person that witnessed the suspect or suspects and draws the composite of who they are the suspect now i want you to really question this and ask yourself what are the odds and the odds are in the millions okay maybe more than that what are the odds that little c's would give the composite sketch artist the attributes and identify through the drawing that he gave a description of the person that he believed to be in that car it end up being Amir Muhammad 
you could only question and ask yourself how many people did little C's and Eugene Deal lock eyes with that night at the Peterson Museum? And out of all the people that they locked eyes with, that the person that they identify as the shooter or potential shooter is Amir Muhammad. To the composite sketch artist, they didn't identify Wardell Pucci Faust as being the shooter by identification that the com co composite sketch artist drew they they didn't do that they didn't they didn't give that description again as i mentioned you have to really use your mind here what are the coincidences and what are the odds that they would give a description through a drawing and it end up being amir muhammad you have to question yourself on that. That's pretty much a red herring there, if you think about it. Now, when they did the shooting, the the shooting was a little a little bit different. There are some parallels to Las Vegas when they shot up the BMW. They didn't use gecko ammunition. The gecko ammunition, when if you listen, and to Greg Kading, he says that gecko ammunition during that time during that time frame. In Compton, the gecko ammunition was not very rare. Okay, if the gecko ammunition was not very rare, nobody in Compton got caught with gecko ammunition. There was probably several guns, and I'm not, and there wasn't probably there was many guns that were picked up during that time frame, and none of them were ever identified as having gecko ammunition. Now you would say, how do I know that? Well. The FBI has a fire database that they track these things and they take logs of peculiar things of, of this nature, such as an ammo being an armor piercing bullet. It's not a common bullet. They don't sell it at Walmart or they don't sell it at Kmart or whatever stores are out there today. You have to get the special manufacturers that make armor piercing bullets. I mean, if you had, everybody had armor piercing bullets, there'd be some trouble. But beyond that, they found gecko ammunition bullets at David Mack's house with radios, with scanners, and he was one of the people that were identified as being at the Peterson Museum by people that wanted to remain anonymous no one wanted to go up against the LAPD. I mean, come on, hell, Russell Poole went up against the LAPD and he got fired or quit. I mean, essentially, he was going to get fired, so he just quit. Many people go up against the LAPD and they get fired or they quit. And these are the things you have to look at. Now, the other the other subject that was, was pretty oh, eye-opening was that in this, and you're going to see this, you're going to see a trend here, okay? Going all the way back to just any piece of information, whether it be a confession letter or whatever it may be, whether it be an informant like Michael Cycle Robinson or whether it be Wayman Anderson or whether it be any informant, Kenneth Boagney, whatever, think about whatever informant that's been involved with this LAPD case, fingering, fingering the LAPD as being is being the potential suspects or the suspects for the notorious BIG shooting. And now I don't believe that there's a, maybe there's a, there's always a possibility that there may have been a police officer that may have shot Tupac Shakur on September 7th, but that's up for debate. There's many theories out there. You just got to pick the one that, that makes sense for you. If that's what you're trying to reach. Now you're looking at the LAPD. Here's another point that came up was that, Kevin Hackey came out and went to the FBI and local FBI in Los Angeles, not not the FBI in Washington, which I feel like is unbiased, would be unbiased in this whole ordeal. But you have Kevin Hackey came out and he said that he could identify who the shooters were and he identified the individuals in question that we're talking about, David Mack, Rafael Perez, Amir Muhammad. Okay. What did they go do? 
somebody in the Los Angeles Police Department leaked out the information that Kevin Hackey was an informant and he was working undercover for the FBI death row, uh, for, uh, infiltrating death row records. And Rolling Stones put this out. And that's when Frank Alexander found out that Kevin Hackey was an informant because he never knew about that in 1997. So if you're listening to what I'm talking about, then you're going to see a trend here. The LAPD leaked out a confession letter regarding the potential uh, suspect for the, the Tupac Shakur killing. They leaked out the information to Chuck Phillips. They, they leaked out the information about Michael Cycle Robinson. They And this is all to the newspaper. And then he got outed, Michael Cycle Robinson. Then he started getting harassed by his gang. They started threatening him because they knew that he was an informant. And eventually, he ended up dying from all the stresses of that. So they leak his information out to the media. They leak out information about Wayman Anderson to the media. They leak out information to the confession letter to the media. They leak out information to the media about Kevin Hackey. This is what the LAPD does. This is their protocol. This is their investigation protocol when you go against their case that's going to absolve their officers and try to slam shut and limit the losses due to lawsuits brought by individuals who are wrongly convicted of crimes. This is what happens. This is the LAPD's protocol. Great Kading and people out there that need to understand this. And there's a lot of you out there that are against the police because you see every day on the news the police that are doing all these crimes against people and trampling on their civil liberties and you see this every day in the news do you really believe that the lapd great kading has tupac shakur notorious big's best interest in mind no he talks about he had a the he had a task force but a lot of times these task force members are being misled because they're on a need to know basis they only know so much information they don't know everything and they're just going along with the investigation. Now, when the great Cadings of the world find out crucial information that could steer the case towards the the plaintiff, which would have been Valetta Wallace, for her potentially winning the case, trust me, he was burying this information. He only wanted to paint the picture that connected this whole East Coast, West Coast beef so that it absolved any police officer involvement. So that they can steer clear from from lawsuits because they were already up to their head in lawsuits with Rampart scandal with Rafael Perez actually coming out and testifying and actually getting some kind of plea deal so that he could identify a lot of the other police officers that were doing wrong. This is fact. Brian Bentley, same thing here. He knew it was taking place and basically he was disenfranchised from the LAPD. He knew about Kevin Gaines. He knew about all these things. Go read his book. Go look at his information. Brian Bentley from the LAPD. A lot of people don't want to come out today and say anything because they're just, you know, it's 20 years down the road. And it, at this point, it's like, you know, if the LAPD wasn't going to be forefront and be just have some kind of damn integrity from the beginning then these cases would have been solved a long time ago. But at the cost of millions of dollars, it's just not going to happen. Not for two rappers that mean nothing to them. And Greg Kading's laughing all the way to the bank because he gets to write a book, he gets to do a docuseries, and a lot of people out there are suckers and get to suck this up and believe that that's what really happened. His only, his only interest is to protect the LAPD. And he would do the same thing to you and trample on your civil liberties and get all these illegal recorded proffer sessions and and make mistakes on search warrants and and all this other stuff and try to marginalize his his police tactics as being okay and normal. These are the kind of police officers, LAPD during that time frame, during that era, that they did all of these questionable things to either hemp people up on bogus charges. And they had people in the department that were stealing drugs and, you know, shooting drug dealers and stealing money from drug dealers and all this other things that I mentioned beforehand. You can't expect for the LAPD to be on the up and up when 
they weren't even on the up and up on the streets. They were there all to protect each other and to make sure that this thing got buried and they were able to move on without any losses. And that's what happened. That's my podcast for the for tonight. I just wanted to kick some common sense to the murder rap followers out there who suck this up from Greg Kading, who is a liar. And if you believe a liar, then you're being fooled because that's that's what he did. This was a ruse. He basically fooled. I'm not going to say the masses because I'm not part of that. But he fooled a lot of people because he was able to paint a picture. Because he was able to manipulate witnesses. He was able to manipulate informants. And always, as I mentioned, the first and foremost protocol for that APD is to make sure that they can tarnish somebody's credibility. And they can tarnish somebody's mental mental status as far as being sane everybody has been become crazy kevin hackey became crazy um, um, um uh the other guy uh, wayman anderson was crazy ken wagney is crazy all these guys are crazy russell pool's crazy russell pool's a drunk that doesn't mean anything being a drunk that just means that he had a personal problem with alcohol that doesn't mean that he was crazy and this guy was solving 100 plus homicides and the LAPD tries to make him out to be some kind of, well, I wouldn't say LAPD. I would say namely Greg Kading. But Greg Kading is just jealous because Russell Poole actually had a decorated career. And if there would have been a police officer like Russell Poole, they would have taken over the investigation and they would have allowed him to investigate David Mack, Rafael Perez. They would have essentially been able to actually actually solve the case and figure out who the real culprits were and who were all that were involved in the murder of Tupac Shakur and the murder of of Keefe D and we wouldn't be having this conversation today about this topic and that is the truth they allowed him to solve a lot of other homicides but when it came to him solving these two homicides and it, and it was in question that he may have to tell on his own police officers that wasn't going to fly not with top brass no way that's not the way you do it. it's the code of blue protect your brothers and police officers do that all the time all across america but lapd is the most corrupt police department it's well i wouldn't say probably now but i would say in the 90s they were one of the most police one of the worst corrupt police departments because there was a lot of opportunity there for the police officers to make a lot of money dealing with drug dealers because drugs were running rampant in Los Angeles, California. And a lot of police officers just couldn't keep that keep that honor and keep that moral compass attached to them. They were blinded by the money. They were blinded by hanging out with people that they would probably never ever hang out with in their life. So that's my podcast tonight. And hopefully you took something away from this. And you weren't, you know, the blinders came off. And if they didn't, that's fine. Like I said, everybody is, is it their own free will to believe what they want to believe? And that's pretty much what it is. I'm going to be working on another project here soon. And that's pretty much it. As I always mention to all my listeners out there, always seek the truth. No matter where it takes you. Have a good night, folks.